So let's turn to the Word of God and let's consider this passage, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. As I said before, there's a, a change in tone in the book. Uh, the rest of the book, from chapter 40 to 66, the predominant theme is of what God is going to do in grace and mercy and glory and salvation and blessing. So it wouldn't be surprising if you know more about the second part of the book than the first part of the book. But it's important that we understand the setting in which chapter 40 starts. There is a gap, not necessarily in time for Isaiah's prophecies, but in terms of the setting. It seems to be that when we get to chapter 40, things have happened. All that God said would happen in chapter 39, the people being carried to Babylon in exile, Jerusalem falling, captivity because of their sins and disobedience, has happened. And the people are laboring now under that distancing from God. They are far from God because they are far from Jerusalem, as it were. They're far from God because their sins have carried them away because he has executed his judgment. And so therefore, we come to these verses realizing that something has happened and yet God is now speaking in grace and mercy to his people. We're looking something like 150 years ahead of where chapter 39 finishes. So it closes... And all that God has threatened happens. The disaster of the exile seems to be coming to an end. Because, you see, God had established his people in the land. God had blessed his people under David and Solomon. And all that God had promised would be the case if they followed him. He delivered and blessed them richly, and yet... They then turned away for no good reason because sin is fundamentally folly. It is rebelling against the best and most glorious of beings for no good reason. Sin is folly as well as disobedience. And so the people and the kingship and the temple worship has all come to an end. That's it. Finish. All the dreams have gone. There is no hope, it seems, because the people are now far away. There is, it seems, no future. But what I want to tell you this morning is that if you are the Lord's people, you have a future that really is a future. Because you can use that word in two senses, can't you? You can say, well, of course there is a future. We are at the end of 2015. We're going to begin beginning 2016 very soon. That's the future in that sense. But on the other hand, I don't know whether you have this figure of speech here, but you can have a, a, a job with no prospects. In other words, it has no future. Nothing will develop from it. Nothing will grow from it. You may have a relationship and you realize it's going nowhere. It has no future. Nothing will develop from it. Well, when God gives us a future, he doesn't just give it to us in the first sense. He gives us it to us richly in that second sense. Christians have a future with a future. So here we are at the end of 2015. As we look at 2016, you may say to yourself, well, this is my situation. There are things that are good about it. There are things that are bad about it. And I suppose the coming year will be pretty much the same. Well, of course, if the Lord is not in your life, that may well be the case. But you just don't, can't think like that with the Lord in your life. Because God gives us a future with a future. The future is not determined by the past. The future is not determined by you. We, with all our limitations, can only think in a certain way about what might God do in the year ahead? What might God do in the rest of my life? Who knows? God does, and our Heavenly Father intends to bless us and enrich us in ways we cannot conceive. We have a future 
with a future because you see we should be looking not to ourselves but to the Lord for what is to come and God deals in the unexpected God promises hope this passage is a passage of hope and it's based not on us but on him and what he plans to do and as we will see when God promises us a future it's not just saying something like oh I wish it could be like it was in the old days I can remember the good times we used to have could we not recapture them you sometimes wish you could go back to the past and and see old friends and old situations but they're, diff they're, they're never the same are they if you go back and you can't turn the clock back and God is not going to turn the clock back because he's got a program and a plan and a purpose that he's going to implement and it's going to be better than the past and as we know from scripture God's plan was never to replant the people of Israel simply back in the land under the same terms and conditions that operated before they were pointing to something better and richer and fuller and more glorious that he is now moving forward and that is what the rest of Isaiah and the rest of scripture is talking about so let's see this this message of comfort and the components of it come in in four parts if you like uh, imagine a circle with four quadrants we need to put each of these together to get the whole picture of what God is talking about in this passage. So we've got a message here, which in verses 1 and 2 is a message of comfort. A message of comfort. That's the words we begin with, isn't it? Comfort. And isn't that a different tone to when God speaks in judgment? Comfort. Oh, comfort my people, says your God. God speaks to those who've rebelled against him, who are far from him, who are alienated, and he comes to them in his own time, on his own terms, according to his own schedule, and says, comfort. There is a word of comfort for the people of God and for those who would look to God. He speaks kindly verse 2 to Jerusalem he's recognizing his people even though Jerusalem is under an alien rule a foreign government he's not speaking about the city he's speaking about the people of God he sees them still as his people he says to them that they should be encouraged because they still belong to him comfort my people says your God he hasn't disowned them and if you're a Christian and you have not lived as you should have done there is an opportunity for you to turn back to the Lord and to receive that word of comfort and as we will see there is a word for all people which is a word of comfort as well because God is ours and we are his and God is saying to her, this time of exile is coming to an end. This time of labor and toil. This warfare, as we have it in verse 2, is ended. Why? Because her iniquity has been removed. The, 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 the trial, the labor, the, the, the time of service, hard labor or warfare has ended that relationship with the Lord is coming to an end because her iniquity her sin has been removed all the issues between us and the Lord relate to sin and now God is declaring sin has been removed the punishment has been full it says here she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins now I don't think we're meant to take that in a literal sense that the offense was this much and God put on them twice as much as they deserved for that wouldn't be just from God I think the figure of speech here is she has been fully dealt with according to what God said in his covenant threats to them and that is over he's telling the people they can relate to him otherwise than on the basis of do this 
and live. Of if you obey me, I will bless you. And if you offend me, I will punish you. There is a different kind of relationship that we can have with God. One that deals with our sin. One that deals with our rebellion. One that deals with our disobedience. Now how exactly that's going to happen is not explained at this point in Isaiah. But it comes later. And many of you who know your Bibles will know that Isaiah 53 has an awful lot to say about that. The Lord's servant is going to deal with it. It isn't that everybody's going to bear their own sin. It is that one perfect servant is going to be wounded for the transgressions of his people. And by his wounds, we can be healed. Now, if we are Christians, that's our position. But sometimes we forget that that's our position. Sometimes we think we are still in that position as though we were under some covenant of, of law, of obedience. If I do well, God will bless me. If I do badly, God will punish me. That is not how fathers ought to deal with their children. That is not how God deals with his people. If we are his people, we are in a position of grace, of acceptance, of blessing. And that is the relationship we can have with God. God is sweeping all of those issues out of the way and saying, I'm forging this relationship with you. It is a relationship of grace. It is a relationship of mercy. It is a relationship of security, of comfort, of joy, of strength, of tranquility, of gladness in every situation. That is our position if we are the Lord's people because we are the Lord's people in the Lord Jesus Christ, the servant who came to establish just that relationship as we will see here. What do you think about your relationship with the Lord if you're a Christian this morning? How do you see it? How do you see your God? Do you see him as a loving heavenly father who delights in you for you are included in his son. You are cleansed by his blood. You are accepted. You don't have to strive to get there. He's got you there. He's included you by grace through faith. That is the whole center and core of the gospel, isn't it? That God can speak words of comfort. And God will always speak kindly to his people, to the heart of his people. That's what that kindly word is talking about there. He's spoken to our hearts and he draws out of us a response of love and delight in him. And if you don't know him this morning, that is the message as we will see when we get to the next part. So it's a message of comfort. But it's a message to prepare, verses 3 to 5. This message does bring a way of upheaval, you might think, oh, well, everything's going to be quiet and lovely and sweet and smooth. No, God says, things are going to have to change. A voice is calling, verse 3, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. You see these machines carving through the landscape, building a new road, and where the bumps are, they flatten them. And where the, the holes are, they fill them in so that as far as you can, you have a clear, straight road. Well, I don't know what your highways are like. Some of ours are in a dodgy state. Um, I think some of yours are too, aren't they? But when they build them, the theory is it's smooth and great. And I don't know whether you have it. You see, you don't, you don't have a queen, but you do have a president, don't you? Do they tidy everything up when the president visits somewhere? Do they sort of smooth the roads and paint the buildings and freshen everything up? We have a joke that everywhere our queen goes, she smells fresh paint. Because actually, this is a picture of a royal visitor coming. And everybody's got to prepare and make it good for their arrival. And God is going to do something. So he tells them, make smooth in the desert a highway, but look at the royal visitor. A highway for our God. They did it in those days, you see. And there they are in Babylon. They know all about the ways of these monarchs and these dictators and these potentates. They like everything to be just so. 
And so you prepare a, a royal highway for them to travel along. Well, God is taking that picture and saying, I'm coming. You prepare for my arrival. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. This is what's going to happen. A royal way for a noble visitor. In fact, the best of visitors. God himself is coming. And it's going to be a remarkable visit. Verse 5, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. Now when our queen goes and visits somewhere in, in the United Kingdom, they know about it where it is, but it doesn't make national news because she goes and visits so many different places. It's a local visit to a particular place. This is not going to be like that. This is going to be everywhere. Everyone's going to know about this. It will be on national news. It will be posted on Facebook. It will be the absolutely predominant theme on Twitter and everything else you can think of. It will be everywhere. God is going to visit in such a way that all flesh will see the glory of the Lord. God is moving his plan on. And the exile's end is going to be such an end that it brings the arrival of God that will not just be a blessing for those who are his people, but even for those who are not yet his people. All flesh will see the glory of the Lord, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You see, what guarantees this will happen is not how hard we try, but the fact that God has planned and purposed it and will do it. It is going to happen. God is going to do this. We need to recognize this and be ready. But the wonderful thing is, God has done this. And this is our blessed position. For we don't just read Isaiah and then come to the end of our Bibles, do we? We've got the new covenant and these words are taken up in the new covenant to tell us what this really is talking about. Matthew and chapter 3 and verses 1 to 6. There Matthew takes these words up from Isaiah and, and uses them to speak about John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 1. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said... So who is the voice in verse 3 of Isaiah? It's John the Baptist. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, because he was a prophet, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. He was making ready the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, that is the voice that fulfills Isaiah 40 verses 3 and 4. It was not fulfilled simply when the people returned in a few numbers from the exile as we read in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. It was fulfilled in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Which is why Matthew in chapter 1, if you go away and have a look at it, brings the genealogy of the Lord Jesus in chapter 1 in three sections. From Abraham to David, from David to the exile, the captivity, and from the captivity to the Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the son of Abraham, he is the son of David, and he is the ender of the real exile. That which the exile in Babylon spoke about is what the gospel is designed to resolve. We are far from God by nature, but by grace we can know the comfort of God in Jesus Christ. These verses are fulfilled in the coming into the world and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The exile is going to end 
But it, with John the Baptist, it means it's Christ Jesus himself who ends that exile. Now it's also a message, the third quarter of our circle, a message to trust wisely. And that's a note back to Hezekiah and other kings and alliances, but also a word to us today. Verses 6 to 8, you see, is another voice. Somebody else is crying out. And they call, what shall I call out? And it, this sounds a little bit like Isaiah 6. You know, who will go? And Isaiah says, well, here am I, send me. Well, there's another voice speaking now, and it's saying, cry out. And they're saying, well, what am I to cry out? And just as Isaiah was given a ministry, so this voice has a message. And it says this, all flesh is grass. And its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now I say to you, that is a message to us to trust wisely. Because we can be very silly people. And we can put our confidence and our trust and our hopes in things that simply cannot bear the weight you have bridges with weight limits on them and you can't put too heavy a truck over the top of that bridge because it may not bear the weight well we have those in the UK you know and they say well don't drive them one of these great big freight things over the top of this bridge because if you do it's going to fall down you can't rest your weight upon it well what can't you rest your weight on all flesh people now the best hope under the old covenant for the prosperity of the kingdom was the king. And we have a, a, an interesting collection of kings, don't we, in the Old Testament. Some of them are godly, some of them are wicked, and some of them are a mixture. Hezekiah is one of the best. But look at Hezekiah in chapter 39. In chapter 38, he's pleading with the Lord for his life. And the Lord blesses him by giving him life. So then he's flattered by these envoys from Babylon looking for an alliance. And he shows them all the treasures in his kingdom. Look at what I've got in here, he says. And look at this over here. And look at these things. Now, whether the people from Babylon are really impressed by what some tin pot little Judah can manage way over there, far away from civilization, because Babylon goes back a long way, you see. And these people are just recent arrivals on the scene, and they haven't got much history. Oh, who am I talking about? Sorry. He has glories, and he shows them without any wisdom or discretion at all, because he thinks he can pin his hopes on Babylon. He had already thought he could pin his hopes on Egypt. And God is always telling the people through the first part of Isaiah, why are you relying on Egypt to save you from Assyria? Because they won't do it, and you know they won't do it. And why are you are re relying on political alliances to bring you safety and security when you should look to me? And why do we rely on the arm of flesh when we have the Lord of hosts? to look to yet we do and the world does it time and time again so that we think that if we've got enough education we will solve the world's problems if we've got enough international agreement we can fix the world's issues if only we could discover the cure to this or the best way to live like that if my hope is in my diet or my exercise plan, if my hope is in my relationship with this person or with that person, or with my investments, or with this or with that, I pour all my hopes and dreams and aspirations into these things, and all flesh is as grass, and it will let you down. Because when it says here, all its loveliness... It's a word that is often used for loyalty, for faithfulness, for reliability. 
There is nothing more useless than a car that will not start in the morning. Or if you don't know whether it will start in the morning, will it get you to work or not? And you, you buy a car that has a reputation for unreliability. Now, I don't know which brands over here break down more than others. But, you know, you work out, don't you? And if they're not brand new, then you know that a couple of years down the line, they, they develop these faults and those faults. The Bible tells us very clearly that human beings are faulty. They will let us down. They won't even mean to let us down. But the best of men are only men at the best. And they will fail us. So why don't we trust in the Lord? Because you see, all the people are like grass. And because they are sinners, the breath of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord blows on them and they pass away. The grass withers, verse 8, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And you might think, well, that's just, you know, a fact that God's word is always reliable. But it's more than that. It's more dynamic than that because we have these words in the New Testament as well. In 1 Peter and chapter 1, the apostle takes up these words and he uses them and explains them in relation to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, For you have been born again, verse 23, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living, enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, this is Isaiah, and all its glory like the flower of grass, the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you specifically, pointedly, it is the gospel of Christ which you should be trusting in. Not only the Bible as a whole, but specifically this gospel will never let you down, will never forsake you, for it points you to Jesus Christ and the grace of God in him. And whatever situation you are in, you can rely on the word made flesh which is offered to you in the word of the gospel which if you are Christ you have received and embraced and should always trust and rely on and yet we so often want some sort of crutch to lean on which is made of flesh trust wisely for your finest hopes will fail but the Lord Jesus Christ endures forever. The gospel is truly good news because it rests not on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Which is why, fourthly, it is a message to proclaim widely. Verses 9 to 11. Look at this exhortation. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of God, to, of Judah, here is your God. We've got a message, if we've heard that message ourselves. And it's not when we say, oh, well, you know, I've got this kind of perspective on things, you see, and it's a little bit different to yours. And excuse me if I just say this for a moment. I don't want to hurt anyone. But I'd like to share this with you and, and see what you think of it. Now, that's not what we're supposed to do with the gospel. We have a message that applies to everyone, that is not just true for me. It is true, and therefore it is true for everyone. It is right. And if we sound arrogant, well, we shouldn't put it across like that. But we should be certain that it doesn't just work for you and your friend and your family. It is for everyone. Because this message is the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and it is for all flesh. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We should never be doubtful or qualified in recommending our Savior to others. We have a message 
that others need to hear. We should tell it to them with grace and with love and with compassion but also with boldness and the certainty that comes, not from our personal experience of it, but the fact that this is God's work and it is God's salvation. It should be proclaimed fearlessly and it is a message to look to God, to look to Him. Because God is coming in power, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with might. Now, what does the world think of Christianity? Is it some kind of fading force? In the UK, they're, they're, they're itching to say, oh, you're not a Christian country anymore. Nobody really believes in God because the statistics say that slightly more than 50% of people believe in God. Therefore, we can't be a Christian country anymore. Well, the idea of a Christian country is an interesting one in the first place because I don't think we've ever converted our beaches or our hills or our forests. But what about the people? Well, they want to say Christianity's had its day. That was for then. Now, well, I'm not sure what now is actually, but anyway, we haven't got a God who can do anything. Well, actually, if you look at the statistics around the world, God is doing an awful lot in bringing people to salvation through Jesus Christ. But the point is this. Whatever the world thinks, God is coming in power and in might with his arm ruling for him. And, moreover, bringing the victory spoils that he's won. His reward is with him. This is the plunder you get from a, a victorious battle. You know, the enemy's defeated, they run away, and all the stuff they leave behind, you scoop up and gather. And the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, has scooped up a great people for himself. He's won a wonderful victory, and he is working out that victory in this world. So he comes with his reward and with his recompense. But he's coming also as the perfect king that Hezekiah got close to, but came so far short of. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs. David was taken from the flock, wasn't he? The king was always supposed to be a shepherd of his people. And yet, so often, was like an unfaithful shepherd. But Jesus Christ, now he's a different matter altogether. He's our king. He's our shepherd king. He is the perfect Davidic king. A king who rules like a shepherd. A king who rules with gentleness. And he's come. He's going to carry them in his bosom. He's going to gently lead the nursing ewes. He's not going to say, right, you, 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 do this, do that. Come up to this standard or that's it. He knows us individually. He deals with us in a tailored way, specifically. And if you are mighty and strong, he calls you to serve him with vigor and energy. And if you're feeling weak and helpless, and you say, well, what can I do for the Lord? Well, then he picks you up and he carries you, because he knows you can't walk. And he brings you along. He puts you into his, his care and carries you. And if you've got a particular di condition, the nursing ewes, those who are with young, well, they need to be nurtured for a while. So you see, this king that we have is such a king. He is mightier than those who would stand up to him with force. And he's gentler than those who fear they will be broken by the power of God. No, he won't break anyone. He will gently lead. He will bring along whoever you are. You can come to Christ and receive him as one who will keep you and bless you. And the point is this. This perfect Davidic king is not just a theory. He has come. You see how it's put here that God in verse 10 is coming with an arm that is ruling and speaks of power. And in verse 11, an arm that will gather the lambs. He is a picture it's an anthropomorphism, isn't it? It's portraying God as having physical characteristics, having arms that will carry. God doesn't have arms. Yes, he does. 
God does have arms. For what is anthropomorphism here becomes incarnation in the New Testament. That's what Christmas is about. The word became flesh. Arms and hands that touched people. Arms and hands that were used to bless people and, and draw people, heal people. Lepers were touched. The blind were touched. And then arms that were nailed to a cross to save us. Crucified in weakness, he now lives in power. This is, after all, the Lord's day, isn't it? The first day of the week, the day of resurrection and life and power. And this is our God. And the message is, here is your God. So, in Jesus Christ, we see all the culmination and fulfillment of what is promised in Isaiah because Jesus Christ is the center and hope of all the scripture. He is the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection, the living water. Which is why you, if you are a Christian, have a future with a future. And if you're not a Christian, that is precisely what God offers you this morning. If you will come to him in Jesus Christ and trust to this Savior and King, you will be the most blessed of people in this world, along with all the people of God. Because this glory is revealed that all flesh might see it. Because God so loved the world that he sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is our Savior. This is our God. And this is why if we are Christians this morning, we have a future that really is a future. Let's close by singing our last hymn.